don't know what you're eating for lunch today, but I can tell you what you are not eating. You are not eating Chick-fil-A today, at least fresh Chick-fil-A. You know what I'm saying? Like it's closed on Sunday. So unless you bought it last night, put it in the fridge, you ain't having Chick-fil-A for lunch. By the way, I need to correct something. Last week, uh, last week I said Dan Cathy was the founder of Chick-fil-A. Dan Cathy is not the founder. He is the CEO of Chick-fil-A, Truett Cathy. He was the guy who started it. And uh, by the way, uh, how many of you love Chick-fil-A here this morning? Amen. How many of you wish you could have Chick-fil-A for lunch? Amen. Take some of that chicken sandwich right now. The reason I mentioned Chick-fil-A is that I want to take a few minutes this morning to talk to you about this idea of culture. And I want you to understand this. Culture is crucial. Can we say that together? Culture is crucial. All right. And it is. Culture is super crucial for all of us. <clears throat> and I think, I think culture is crucial, and my guess is you do too. It's crucial for customers. It's crucial for employees. It's crucial for teams. It's crucial for churches. It's crucial for marriages. It's crucial for families. And it is crucial for your future. Culture is crucial. And we need to embrace that and we need to understand that this morning. Culture is crucial. So think about it. When it comes to business and when it comes to people getting your business in particular, you, do you, like to, you don't like to waste your time and you don't like to waste your money. So we tend to go to places where we know what we're going to get and where we know that the culture is good particularly when it comes to the organization. See, we love Chick-fil-A, and it's not because Chick-fil-A makes a chicken sandwich that is a mile better than everybody else. That's not the reason we go to Chick-fil-A. The reason that we go to Chick-fil-A, the reason that if you go to Tifton on any given day other than Sunday, you're going to see cars that nonstop wrapped around the building. Okay? By the way, uh, Chick-fil-A and God's kingdom is expanding. They're adding another Chick-fil-A I hear in Tifton sometime soon, so now you'll have another one that you can go to, right? Yeah, Amen. Praise the Lord. You go to Chick-fil-A because of the culture that Chick-fil-A has produced. People like to work for Chick-fil-A because of the culture that's produced. When you go to Chick-fil-A and you order something and they bring it out to you and they give you the tray or the bag and you say, thank you, their response is always the same. What is it? My pleasure. And you go there for that reason. At some other places, when you go, they don't say, when you say thank you, they don't say my pleasure. They just look past you and go next, right? We've been to those places before. When you go to Chick-fil-A, another thing that we love about Chick-fil-A, because the culture that they have created for all of their workers, they, they thrive in excellence. They're chasing after that top 2%. They want to do the little things really well. When you go there, when you go to Chick-fil-A, 99.9% .9 of the time, only Jesus would get it right 100% of the time, but 99.9% .9 of the time, you're going to get what you order. I mean, that's a novel idea in today's generation and in today's world, right? You go to other places and they like to move the decimal. You get what you, get what you ordered 9.99% of the time. There's nothing more frustrating than getting halfway home with your bag and you look and it's not in there, right? It's not all in there. You go to Chick-fil-A and they greet you with a smile and they welcome you. They've created a culture that makes it inviting and you want to show up. You want to be a part of it. You want to you know that the food is going to be the same. It's always going to be well prepared. You are going to be served well. And so you just go to Chick-fil-A because it's the culture. So again, we gladly go to Chick-fil-A because we know and we trust the culture that they have created as an organization. They have what I consider, and we're just going to use this terminology today. They have what I consider a terrific culture. Terrific. It's, I mean, it's just an absolute, like no one goes into Chick-fil-A. I, I, I shouldn't say no one. I mean, I guess there's the rarity, but usually when you go into Chick-fil-A, you have a pleasant experience. I mean, it's, it's so much fun there. It's so pleasant. It's so nice. It's clean. The food is good. The quality is good. The people are friendly. And, and you go there for that reason, because they have such a terrific culture. And we love being a part of terrific cultures, do we not? But there are two other cultures that exist when we think about organizations, companies, places. There are other cultures. Um, there's what I, can, I call a tolerable culture. A tolerable culture is not a bad culture, and it's not a good culture. It, it doesn't make you want to run out of it, but it doesn't necessarily make you want to run to it either. It's just tolerable. And then there's a third culture. And the third culture is what I call toxic culture. And so a toxic culture is, is a culture that 
It's one that you want to run out of immediately. You ever been in a place like that? You just got to the place and you're like, I, I don't, I just don't want to be here. I want to run out of this thing. Um, years ago, I worked for an AC company. This was right when I got out of the military. I was living in Jacksonville, worked for an AC company. And part of what I would do, obviously, is you go and work on broken equipment, but then you also go and clean equ equipment. And one particular Saturday, I was working and I got a call, said, hey, they're having a problem at this house. Would you go check it out? So I, I jump in the truck. I drive over to this lady's house. I, I get there. <clears throat> and, and as soon as I open the door, when I walk in the door, I, I, you know, and I, I'm a dog person and I, we have dogs in our house. Um, but this lady didn't have one dog or two dogs. She had like 12 dogs and she had about 12 cats. And, and, when you, and, and I don't think they'd ever been groomed or ever been bathed. And, and I, don't think, um, I don't think they were ever let out because I think they used the restroom the whole time in the house. And I remember as soon as I walked in, the smell hits me in the face. And I didn't want to breathe. Like I literally just wanted to hold my breath when I went in their house. And I could not wait I couldn't wait to get out. I mean, literally, I'm trying to just hurry up and do what I got to do inside so I can get back out. That's what I mean by toxic culture. That, that thing that you just can't even breathe. It feels suffocating. Terrific, so a terrific culture. We want to stay there. We want to live there. We enjoy things there. It's inspiring. And in it, we typically have great experiences. Tolerable culture. In tolerable cultures, we're okay there. We don't love it, but we don't despise it. We don't pick it, but we don't avoid it either. It's not inspiring, and in it we typically are just okay. And then in toxic cultures, we want to avoid it. We can't wait to get out. And we typically, typically, it's typically suffocating, and we, attend, we tend to avoid those altogether. Um, so you may, have, you may have family members that... You know, you go to their house and like, you're excited. That's a terrific culture. You go there, you know that things are going to be just right and you love spending time with them. The people are good. The place is good. Then there's some tolerable ones. You know, there's those family members that you tolerate. And if you don't know who those are, it might be you. I'm just saying. And then there's the toxic culture. There's the family members that, you know, when you, you would tell your kids, hey, load up, we're going to so-and-so's house. They're like, oh my goodness. We all know who the cultures are, right? And so there's the there's the terrific, and there's the tolerable, and then there's the toxic. The reason I bring this up is I want to ask you a question. I want to ask you kind of a series of questions. What is your current culture? What's the current culture of your job? Don't answer out loud, especially if your boss is sitting next to you. What's the current culture of your marriage? What's the current culture of your team if you are a ball player? What's the current culture of your marriage and your life? What is that? What's the, what's the culture within your heart like? When you think about your life right now, when, you're, when you sit alone, when you were on the car ride here, if you sat in quiet, or maybe it was this morning earlier, or it was last night, when you have time to sit and ponder and you don't have a radio going or a TV going and you're just thinking, what's the current culture of your heart? What's going on in there? Do you stay busy so that you can escape? Or do you just enjoy the quiet? Because the culture within you is good. And the reason that I ask about your life and your heart is because we're not just culture consumers, we're culture carriers. We are culture creators. We are both influenced by culture and we are influencers of culture everywhere we go. And the reason that culture is so cru crucial is because culture creates. Culture creates atmospheres, culture creates, culture shapes. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul would say this in Romans 12 too. He would say, do not be what? All right, so we're going to try this all together now. All right, wake the person up next to you. Do not be what? Conform to this world. In other words, what Paul is trying to tell us is that there is a world that is constantly trying to shape us. How many of you played with Plato when you were a kid? How many of you still play with Play-Doh, adults? Yeah, I mean, it's okay. You remember they had those little molds and you'd put it in there and you'd squeeze it together. That's what that picture is. It's the word picture behind it, that the world is literally shaping you and molding you. And it's shaping how you believe. It's shaping how you, uh, not just believe, but how you behave. It's shaping the attitudes, uh, the culture that exists within you, the, the attitudes in your heart, how you feel about yourself, how you feel about your current situation. And Paul would say, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So don't, 
Paul's saying, don't let this world impress upon you its values. Do not let the culture of this world shape how you think. Do not let it shape how you feel. Do not let it shape how you view the world and view other people. Don't let the culture of this world influence how you treat people. And it's really easy because I, I don't know about you, I just get frustrated sometimes when I turn the news on or I turn my phone on and I see things that are going on and how people are being mistreated. And then we get angry at the people who are mistreating people. And then we, then we think about how we would love to mistreat them. And then you go, well, wait a minute, this is kind of, it's like self-defeating, right? We're, we're sitting here talking about people in a way that we're, we're criticizing them for. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus provided for all of us, for everyone who believes, for everyone who places faith in him, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus provided for those who profess faith in him with this thing called justification. And if you've been with us over the course of these first 10 weeks of the Remember series, the last several weeks we've been in Romans chapter 4, and Paul has been talking about a man named Abraham and how Abraham was believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. In other words, he believed and was justified. And what um, I want us to look at today is that this idea that there was, a, in the moment that we are justified in God's eyes, we are literally moved, almost if you could imagine God plucking your soul up and moving it out of condemnation and into a place of reconciliation, that you are moved. Remember, it's almost a reversal of the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve sinned, Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden. They were placed, they were separated away from the presence of God. So through justification, it's a reversal of that. God takes us out of sin and death and he moves us back into his presence. And so it's a culture. God moves us out of the toxic culture of sin and into the healthy, terrific culture of his grace, into the presence of into his very presence, into this place we call justification. In Romans chapter 4, verses 23 through 25, and so I just want to, I want to read this as a way of finish, kind of going back and seeing the cliffhanger that he left us with last week so that we can jump into five. Here's what Paul says. Um, but the words, it was counted to him, were not written for his sake alone, but also for ours. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead, Jesus, our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our what? Justification. Justification. So again, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus provided for those who profess in him an opportunity for justification. And in it, we are then placed into a new culture. So let's take a look this morning at this crucial culture called justification. Because here's the thing. We wrestle constantly. We live in this world that's constantly trying to batter us and beat us. We live in this world today where it's so discouraging. It's hard to be a Christian. Not just hard to live, it's hard to even be a Christian because, I mean, even in today's culture, we're being criticized for what we believe. And people are trying to tell us to back down, be quiet, because you're irrelevant. And so it's really hard to live in this culture. So how are we supposed to respond? How are we supposed to live? How are we supposed to stay healthy? How are we supposed to stay positive? How are we so supposed to stay encouraged in our following of Jesus? Well, Paul's going to tell us here in Romans chapter 5. Look in verse 1. Paul says, okay, so he, followed, he ends up talking about justification at the end of 4. And then he says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So I want to talk to you about what the culture of justification is. So if you are in Christ, you should live in a culture, as Paul is going to describe here, of justification. Well, what is that? Number one, we have peace with God. That's what Paul says in Romans 1. How many of you in here, don't, you don't have to answer out loud and you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you in here would love to have a culture of peace in your heart and mind right now? How many of you would be able to lay, love to be able to lay your head down on your pillow at night and just go, I can go straight to sleep because I don't have any worries. I don't have any stress. I don't have any strain. How many of you would love to live in a state of peace? Well, Paul says, because of justification, we have peace with God. Since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. Paul says in verse 10, if we'll, we'll read this in a minute, but he does say in verse 10 that we were once enemies of God. Did you know that? Like when you were born, you didn't like you weren't born and 
Like you were just, you know, like babies, we see babies and everybody grabs a baby and goes, oh, they're so cute. They're so innocent, right? When we were born, we were born an enemy of God. We were born in sin. So we were born separated from God. Now, we know that we have an eternal enemy. His name is Satan. And Satan is also known as the accuser. So when you are accused by the enemy, um, that, that's tough because you deal with it on the inside. But we also have not just a perceived enemy in, um, we don't just have an enemy in Satan, but we also have perceived enemies in our life. You ever misjudge someone? You ever misunderstood someone? You ever taken some things that people have said and misconstrued the things that they have said because you interpreted through a lens that has been shaped by the culture that you live in? Has there ever been a moment in your life like you felt like you lived with someone who was being in that moment an enemy of you? That you felt like this person is just my enemy. They make me, you know how toxic that culture is. Have you ever worked with someone you kind of felt like you wouldn't call them an enemy, but you kind of felt like they are, they're against me. They're not for me. So that our, our hearts feel the weight of that. If you've ever been in a household where there is this enemy uh, relationship or what is a perceived enemy relationship with another human being, that's toxic. And when we live in it, it is suffocating. And we know what that's like. We've all been in those kinds of situations, whether it's in, at the job or in the home. But here's what we all know, that when we have a perceived enemy, there is no presence of peace. When we have, when we have a perceived enemy in our heads, there is no peace that resides in our heart or in our mind, that we are constantly in a state of conflict. And what we want most in that moment, what we want most whenever we feel like someone is against us and not for us, that we have an enemy, the one thing that we want the most is we just want some clean air. Just kind of like how I felt in that lady's house that day. I just wanted to get out. I wanted to be able to breathe deeply. And we've all been there. Having an enemy is kind of like having a baby with a dirty diaper. You know what I'm saying? It's like, man, I just want to get rid of that dirty diaper. I just want to get rid of that thing. We used to have these things. Do they still make these things called diaper genies today? Do they? Man, those things are an invention from Satan. I don't know if you've ever used one, but you take a diaper that's dirty and you put it and you twist it and it creates like this little um, almost sausage looking plastic wrap thing. And you just keep shoving them in there until it fills up and then you take it out. And when you take it out, that's a toxic culture. Amen. And Paul says that when we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. Peace. If you're here today and you're looking for peace, the only way that you're ever going to have it is you have to be justified by grace. You have to be justified by what Jesus has done. You have to be justified by faith in what Jesus has done. And when you do that, you are no longer an enemy of God. You are now considered something else. You are placed into a culture where he is not your foe, but he is your father. And you can live in peace and you can have the peace of God. Verse two, he says, through him, we also have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. This grace in which we stand. This grace in which we stand. When we stand, we stand in a place or a space. And there are people in places You know, you just don't get access to everybody and you don't just get access to any space that you want to go into because God is holy and because he cannot have sin in his presence. While we are in sin, we do not have access into the presence of God. If you are living in in sin and you're living, um, you've never accepted Jesus by faith, you've never had a salvation moment, then you are an enemy of God. And because you're an enemy of God, you don't just get access into the presence of God. But Paul would say here, he says, through Jesus, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And because we are in sin, or if we are in sin, while we are in sin, we do not have access to his presence. We do not have access to his love. We do not have access to his power. We do not have access to his blessings. Not only do we not have access, but there is, there's nothing that me and you, there's nothing that we can do to earn our way in. There is none. 
Several years ago, when we lived in Florida, and back in 2005, I was chaplain for a football team down there that Coach Buddy Nobles was the coach of. And we had this young man, his name was Brendan Odom. And Brendan was a middle linebacker. Uh, Brendan was, he was like first team, all, we called him districts there. They call him regions here. He was, I mean, he led the team in tackling his junior year, his senior year. And I remember um, Brennan, Brennan didn't come from, uh, he, he didn't, you know, his family didn't have a lot. He, he came from a very poor area. Um, the place where we were living is very much like Osula. And, uh, but Brennan and I had a very good relationship. Brennan used to come to my house on Saturdays and we'd watch college football together. And I remember th- about this time of year, it was spring. I, I called Brennan up because I was going to take Will. Um, Will at the time was probably about four or five years old. Um, so I guess he would have been about five, maybe six. He'd have been five at the time. And I was going to take Will to the Florida spring football game. And so uh, I called Brendan up. I said, hey, Brendan, would you love to go with us to the, would you like to go with us to the Florida spring football game? And Brendan was like, yes, sir, pick me up. And so I was like, all right, I'll be right there. So I drove over, picked him up. We get to the stadium at the University of Florida. I walk up to the ticket booth. And as I'm walking up to the ticket booth, Brendan keeps walking in a different direction. I'm like, Brendan, where are you going? He's like, no, 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 come with me. So what, 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 I, I just thought maybe there was another ticket booth around the corner that I didn't know about. And maybe, maybe he wanted um, to sit in a different section where maybe some of his friends were going to be at. And we round the corner from the ticket booth. We come around the other side and we walk up to this door and there's this guy standing there with kind of a security jacket on, the little yellow security jacket. And when we walk up, I'm like, Brendan, you can't go in that door, man. And so Brendan... Brendan uh, pulls out of his, he had a little thing tucked in his shirt. He pulled it out and he had, he was a, it was a recruiting pass. And so he shows it to the guy and he says, come on in. And then Brendan turns around and he says, there with me. And so that day, Will and I got to go in. We got to sit in the recruiting stands for the Florida football game. We then, after it was done, got to go into the weight room, meet all the coaches, talk with all the coaches. We then stood in a hallway where the coaches' offices and the weight room was at. And as we were standing there, I was talking to a friend of mine who worked at the University of Florida. He was one of the trainers. And as I'm standing there having a conversation with him, I looked down the hall, probably from about here to my wife, and all of the football players that I knew were standing around someone whom I could not see because there was a column on the wall and whoever that was was standing behind the column and I'm trying to look from this angle and so I was like who are they talking to so I I, I got done talking with my friend and I walked down there and as I walked down there around the corner there stands in the middle of all those players Urban Meyer and they're all talking and by the way this was in the day students before we had these things called uh, cameras on our phones I know it's hard to believe uh, and, and I had a camera and it wasn't a digital camera. It was one of the 35 millimeter cameras. Y'all remember those. And so I'm standing there and I was like, oh my goodness, this is Urban Meyer. And so I've got Will and I was like, hey, recruiting visit right here real quick. And so I've got Will. And, and so when we get done, I, you know, Urban Meyer, very kind, shook my hand, asked if Will was my son. I said, yes, sir. I said, would you mind taking a picture? And he's like, I don't mind at all. So Urban Meyer gets down on one knee, puts his arm around Will. I go to push the button out of film. Here's my point in all that. Because Brendan was being recruited, Brendan got me access to a space and a person that I would have never had access to otherwise. And what the Apostle Paul says here in chapter 5, verse 2, he says, Through him we have also obtained access by faith into the grace in which we now stand. It's as if Jesus looks at me and you, enters into the presence of the Father, and says, There with me. And because of who Jesus is, not because of who you are, not because of where you go to church, not because of how many Sunday school classes you've attended, not because of any of those things, but because of who Jesus is. If you are justified by grace in your faith in Jesus, you gain access into the presence of God. It's not because of who you are. We have access to God. Second half of verse two. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So not only do we have um, peace with God, not only do we have access to God, but we also have hope in God's plan. So here's the thing. So think about this. Paul says that we have peace with God. That takes care of our past. All your sins in Jesus, if your faith is in him, all your sins in your past, forgiven. And then Paul says, um, access to God. So now you have God's 
presence. You are, your sins are forgiven in the present. And then he says, because of all of these things, we rejoice in the hope and the glory of God. Now the hope of the glory of God takes care of our future. Past, present, future. All because we are justified by the work of Jesus. Now again, you have to have placed your faith in that accomplished work. It doesn't just get thrown onto you. You aren't, it's not like, you know, you're born in America, you're an American citizen. That's not how it works in the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God, you have to be adopted in. You have to place your faith in what Jesus has done. Then you are allowed access. Verses three and four, he goes on to say, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and, and character produces hope. How many of you rejoice in your sufferings? It's a hard saying, but here's the point. We now have, because of justification and the culture that justification gives us, that environment that we're in, that terrific culture, we now have what? Confidence in God's purposes. That even when life hurts, that even when life is hard, that even when life is difficult, because of the fact that my past, present, and my future is taken care of, my sins are forgiven, and I have hope for the future. Because I have hope for the future, it's not hope because of me. It's hope because of what God has done. And because of that, I can have confidence in God's purposes. And here's basically what Paul's doing. Paul's giving us a math equation. How many of you like math? All right. There's, a, there's like two or three of you in here. <laughs> it, it all got messed up, right, when they started putting the alphabet together with numbers, right? And asking what X equals. It's like, I have no idea. X marks the spot. That's what that is. Here's what he's saying. Testing. Let me give you this math equation. You can write it down if you want. Testing plus Christ. Testing plus Christ equals, and he says, patience. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. Testing plus Christ equals patience. Patience. So then he goes on to say, he says, we rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance. Endurance or patience plus Christ equals character. When you have patience, when you're patiently waiting on the Lord, when you're enduring, when you have steadfastness, and Jesus is in that equation, your focus is on him, you're in that culture, then it equals character. You, you are able to produce, God is able to produce in you character. And then character, he says, character produces hope. Character plus Christ equals hope. Character plus Christ, or testing plus Christ equals patience. Patience plus Christ equals character. Character plus Christ equals hope. Verses five through 11, and we're gonna shoot through them. Here we go. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak at the right time, I love that word, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us. So in other words, he's saying, you know, a really good person, you might sacrifice your life. Somebody who's got real big character, they might be willing to lay their life down for another person. And that person would have to be a really good person. He says, but while we were yet sinners, in our worst moment, what Paul was teaching us here, in, our, in, in the worst possible moment, if you could think back in your head to the moment when you committed the most vile sin that you feel like you've ever made in your life, when you felt so ashamed of yourself that you didn't want to show your face in public, in that moment, Christ died for you. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we save, be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, how much more or much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life? More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Reconciliation. To be reconciled means that you had a strained relationship, a separated relationship. And when you're reconciled, that means your relationship is put back together. It is whole. It is one. 
And so because of that, the last thing, the last part of God's culture, we experience God's love. So we have, we have peace with God. Because, this is the culture. Because of justification, this is the culture that we get put in. We have peace with God. We have access to God. We have hope in God's plan. We have confidence in God's purposes, and we experience God's love. Did you know that culture breeds culture? Did you know that because we are shaped by the culture that we place ourselves in, we become culture carriers and we become culture, uh, we, and then we carry that culture into other cultures wherever we go? You are shaped. There's reasons that you do the things you do. You were, you were raised in a culture. You, a lot of us um, parent the way our parents parented. A lot of us um, uh, interact relationally with our spouses the way our, our, we saw our parents. Um, you were created and shaped by a culture. We all were. And then a lot of those times, because we're shaped that way, we behave that way. Now, what we then have to do is, as we talked about earlier, we have to not be transformed or conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. When we're saved, when we are justified, we live in a culture, a different culture. We live in this cultural um, uh, culture of justification. And when we do, we experience God's love. So I've told you the story before, but I want to share it again real brief. Um, the story of the coffee bean. It's a book. Uh, um, I encourage you to read it. It's a short story, really, to teach a truth. And... Um, in it, there's a, a little boy, and he's, he's in class, and uh, he's having a tough time. Things are not going well. And so he says, here's, he's, and he's talking to his teacher, and he's just telling, you know, life at home, not great. And life is hard, and school's not going well. And teacher pulls him aside and says, hey, I want you to do me a favor. When you go home, I want you to take, um, I want you to take a, an egg, and I want you to put some water in a pot, and I want you to boil the water, then I want you to put the egg in, and I want you to leave it for several minutes, and then... Uh, after several minutes, I want you to take the egg out, and I want you to come back tomorrow and tell me what happened to the egg. So he does. He comes back the next day. He says, uh, uh, what happened to the egg? And the boy says, well, the, the boiling water made the egg hard. He says, great. He says, today I want you to go home, and I want you to take a carrot, and I want you to put the carrot in the boiling water for several minutes. I want you to take it out. I want you to come back tomorrow and tell me what happened. So he comes back the next day, and he says, what happened? And he says, well, when I put the carrot in the boiling water for a while, it made the carrot soft. And he says, so today I want you to go home. I want you to boil some water and I want you to take one coffee bean and I want you to put the one coffee bean in the boiling water and I want you to come back and tell me what happened. And so the next day the boy comes back and he says, what happened? And he says, well, the coffee bean turned all of the water into coffee. And so he says, well, here's, the, here's what I want you to learn. He says, life is like, it's the culture. He says, life is the boiling water, the culture that you place your sin. That's the boiling water. And he says, you can either let it make you hard and bitter or you can make it, you can let it make you soft where life just runs you over or you can get into the culture and you can change the culture of your life. And so we are shaped by culture, but we don't have to duplicate the culture that we were shaped by. We can allow the word of God and, and the culture of justification to shape us and change our life, change how we think, change how we treat others. And we can shape the environments then that we go into. Now we have to be careful and we have to live missionally and on purpose because we all know that culture trumps vision. The culture that you put yourself in will kill the vision that you have for your life. You can hang around negative people long enough that you become negative. And so you have to be the change. You, we have to be the culture. Jesus said it this way, go make disciples. Go change the culture. Go change the world. Make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and then teaching them to observe all that I've commanded. In other words, go create a culture, a culture of love. And this is what he's saying. When, when we are justified, God puts us into this culture where all of these things happen, the last one being we experience God's love. One last story, and then we're closing. Um, a couple of weeks ago, it was a Saturday, it, and the, the week leading up to the Saturday had been chaotic. Uh, it, it, it was, I mean, really, really busy week. We had a lot going on, um, I mean, there, there were repairs being done at the church. There were meetings that were taking place. There were a lot of meetings that I had, not just here at the office, but I had meetings on campus um, and around with different people. And it was just one of those crazy weeks where you look up, you, you, you hit the office Monday and you go, okay, cool, got a really great week planned out. And then you get to the end of the week and everything that you had planned didn't happen. 
And so I remember uh, Saturday came along and uh, my son Evan and the soccer team and Riley's over here, he plays soccer. Uh, they had a Saturday soccer game, unusual for a middle school soccer team. And they were playing way over in Lee County. And so um, Evan's like, dad, would you come to the soccer game? And so I don't have to ride the bus home. Cause if you play the boys, I think played first that day. And if the boys play and then the girls play, they have to sit and watch the girls play, which is not, you know, obviously a bad thing to do. You want to support your teammates, but then you sit there that whole time. Then you got to ride the bus all the way back and it just takes, it's a much longer day. So Evan was like, dad, would you, um, would you come pick me up? And I was like, buddy, I said, man, I want to go to your soccer game so bad. And, it, but it's been a crazy week and I really need this Saturday morning. So I'm, I'm dropping him off. I'm taking him up to the school, dropping him off. And I'm going, it's just been such a crazy week. I really need this morning to get my head wrapped around the message for tomorrow. I really need to do that. And so as he's getting out, I'm getting ready to let him out of the truck. And he looks at me and he said, I said, I said, buddy, are you going to be okay? Like, are you okay to, for me to not come and to not pick you up? He says, dad, it's all right. Just like that. He said, dad, it's okay. He, in that moment, his love was shown towards me in a way to go, it's not about my wants, it's about your needs. And if you need to do that, dad, then you do that. And that culture of love spreads. So now I get home and I'm working and thankfully it was almost like God was just like, I mean, giving it to me. Sometimes you got to labor through these things and then these messages. And then other times it's like, you just can't type fast enough to, it's like God's just downloading it to you not on dial-up speed, but I mean, like, you know what I mean? And, and so that day, it was kind of like, I was like, I mean, just hammered it out, got it all done. And I was like, oh, I was like, man, I've got time to make it to Lee County. And so his words, his, the, the culture of love that he created put into my heart a culture of love to go, man, I don't want my kid to play a game and me not be there. I don't want my kid to have to think his dad doesn't love him and have to ride a, a bus back, whatever. And so I grabbed my stuff and I said, you know what, I'm taking off, I'm going. So I drove to Lee County, picked him up, and we had the best day. I mean, we, I mean it wasn't anything special. We just drove back from Lee County, had a bite to eat on the way back through Tifton, went to, went to Lowe's. I mean, nothing special, but I'll never forget it. You know why? Because there was a culture of love created that day and reciprocated that day. And we get to do the same thing. As followers of Jesus Christ, God has demonstrated his love to us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And because of that, and because of that, we should in turn love people who sin against us. We should love people who are not like us. We should love people who are unkind to us. We should love people not because they've earned our affection. We should love them in spite of the fact that they can't. And that's a culture that's terrific. And that's the culture that we get put in when we are justified by grace. And when we are, and here's the beautiful part of this, and this is to me why it's so important. It's so important. Don't, please don't ever forget this. The greatest lie the devil will ever tell you is church is not important. And I'm not up here preaching this because I'm the pastor of the church and I just love it when everybody shows up. I do love it when everybody shows up, but probably not for the reasons that you think. I love it when everybody shows up because when you show up to church, you're placing yourself in a culture where hopefully people will demonstrate love to you. You can feel love to go reciprocate that love. You can sit under the teaching of the word of God. The Bible says that God is love. And so when we're with one another, we get to love one another. We get to listen to the teaching of the word of God who in his love for us sent his son to die for us so that he could put his spirit in us that we might become the presence of God in the world and demonstrate his love. Culture breeds culture. Culture breeds culture. The more time we spend in a negative world, in a sinful world, surrounded by people who aren't going the direction we're going, the more we tend to be like them. The more time we surround ourselves with people who are following Jesus, the more we tend to become altogether like Jesus. It's a beautiful culture. And if you don't know Jesus today, the first place you have to start is you have to start with accepting Jesus by faith. It starts there. Because without trusting Jesus by faith, without admitting your sin, placing your faith in Jesus and what he did on the cross for you, there is no justification for you. And with no justification for you, 
you're separated from God. You'll never, you'll never live in this beautiful, terrific culture called justification. And you'll never be accepted by God. You'll never have peace. You'll never understand his purposes and his plan. And you'll struggle in the world. 